part of the Leconomics Research Group, he's been developing new computer assisted methods of analysis, which sounds really interesting and very, very cool. Um, his main interests, interest, excuse me, are Anglo-Saxon, medieval literature, evolutionary epistemology, excuse me, fantasy and science fiction, J.R.R. Tolkien, cognitive approach to literacy text, digital analysis of literature at, in lexonomics. So uh, some other interests apparently he has is birding, fishing, and ice hockey, which is also very exciting. Uh, so what position do you play in ice hockey? Oh, I, I usually played um, right wing. That's right how, wing. I, it's how I met my wife actually was on. Oh, that. excellent. You know, because if you're in, you know, Stanford, California, Yes. And you want to meet a five foot tall, 100 pound woman who was born and raised in Jamaica. The ice hockey team is the obvious place to look. Obviously. Um, that, <laughs> Obviously. That's how we met. So excellent. So um, make sure let's share your screen. We'll put you as the speaker. Okay. And uh, we should see you now. So if, whenever you would like to get started. Thank you for coming. OK, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, this is the, I taught, you know, like everyone else has had to do, I taught remotely um, all spring, but it was, it was very different. So this setup and everything is, a, is an experiment for me. I, I hope it, it, uh, it works. And I really appreciate uh, being, being invited to give this talk. I mean, I was looking forward to coming out to the library and everything. And I, I really thought that when we, you know, talked about the beginning of July, I'm like, oh, well, clearly we'll be able to travel anywhere we want by then. Um, so uh, don't take my predictions on anything as a, as a good um, measure. But I wanted to talk to you tonight about, and by the way, this, uh, this can be, since it's, I mean, it's challenging for me, but I'm, I've got help. Um, to make this interactive. So if you have questions at any point, you know, put up a hand, hit the, hit the put your hand hit up. Hit the button. chat. You can either ask in chat or you can um, put, a put a reaction up to raise your hand. Um, I'll be willing to ask the questions. Um, so at the bottom of your screen where it says chat, just click on that and it'll pop up in the lower right hand corner and you'll be able to ask any questions. For yeah, Professor and, so, and I and I, you know, I don't have a like. I'm not going to read from a script, so it's easy right. to pause and and explain something um, more one way or the other. So, so what I wanted to to talk about uh, today is the the origin of of Tolkien's ideas. The famous you know question that uh, every writer I've uh, of fantasy that I've ever had a chance to meet or talk to always says that people ask them, "Where do you get your ideas?" And writers get had started coming up with flip and snotty answers to that sometimes. Um, I think because a lot of times we don't know where we get our ideas or um, it, it, the process isn't clear. But I, I think I can actually answer um, that question for a lot of things for J.R.R. Tolkien. And that, that might seem a little strange because, you know, Tolkien's so amazingly inventive. So many things that he envisioned uh, that you know, we all now see that never existed, Hobbits and the Shire, and, and, and of course, some of this, uh, so much of this brought to life by Peter Jackson's um, filmmaking. So how can I say that, like, where did he get his ideas? But in fact, he, he got his ideas from uh, a lot of the books behind me, because uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and I have the same day job. Uh, he was a professor of Anglo-Saxon, uh, he was at Oxford, um, he was the Bosworth Rawlinson Professor of Anglo-Saxon. It's the most prestigious uh, chair in Old English in the world. It goes back to the 1700s. Um, and it was quite a, a coup for him to be elected to it at such a young age. And in fact, there was controversy about that because uh, there was an obvious candidate for the, the chair. And that was a guy named... Um, R.W. Chambers, who wrote this book, uh, Beowulf, and uh, the title is uh, Beowulf, an introduction to the study of the poem with a discussion of the stories of Afa and Finn. And you know, my publishers tell me I need less boring titles. Uh, but uh, R.W. Chambers was sort of like the, the most eminent Anglo-Saxonist. And when the chair came open, they asked him to do it. And he turned them down. 
Nobody ever turns down Oxford for this, but he did. He didn't want to leave London. And he said, I recommend this uh, young man, this young Mr. Tolkien. He's, uh, he's quite an up and coming young scholar. And uh, Tolkien was up for the chair. Uh, the other person was Tolkien's tutor. So it's kind of like me and one of my students coming up for the same job and then giving the job to the student and uh, not to me. It was, all, I won't say scandalous, but it surprised everyone, uh, this, this move. Uh, but not, not too much because Tolkien was even at that young age. And this was in, you know, he, was, he became that professor in 1925. Um, so even at that young age, he was recognized as having uh, this immense talent for uh, what he, he and I would call philology. Um, now, that's a word that's sort of fallen out of favor. You might think of philology as sort of a, the ancestor of both linguistics and literary study. So philology was the scientific study of language, but nowadays, um, Linguistics is the scientific study of language, but it focuses almost entirely on spoken language and living languages, whereas philology is about texts and it's about usually about dead languages and looking to the past. And Tolkien was one of the four or five greatest philologists in, um, in history, uh, it turns out. He was unbelievably gifted at figuring out puzzles that we have left to us in old texts. And from this work in his day job come a lot of the insights and the imagination that he then used uh, in creating The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. And uh, now I, I'm not at all suggesting that there's not also a kind of a level of, of imaginative and creative genius. You know, it's one thing, as, as I'll show you here, to come up with um, some ideas about some particular lines in Beowulf, and it's a whole other thing to, you know, envision all of Middle Earth. But what I will argue is that it, were, it was problems and challenges in his day job that sparked him to, to think about other, uh, other, the things that became his uh, fantasy. And I'll just, I'm actually going to go to one of the, the less discussed ones here because it's in a book that Tolkien didn't write. Um, where is it? Okay. So this is uh, The Life and the Passion of St. Juliana. And it's, it's by uh, a woman named Simone Dardenne, who was uh, one of Tolkien's students. Uh, interestingly, almost all the students, Tolkien's students who went on to some success in the profession were women at a time when there weren't a lot of women yet at Oxford or in uh, studies. And uh, Simone Dardenne was from Belgium and survived horrible stuff during the Second World War. And I guess then showed up at Oxford ask afterwards, clutching a pile of papers that was her dissertation, and it turned into this book. Now, this is a, a, a text in here. Uh, it's a Middle English text, um, so like the time of Chaucer, that's uh, about the life of St. Juliana, and it doesn't seem to have a lot to do with Tolkien, except that in this book is the very first instance of the word burglar that shows up in English. And in fact, the figuring out what this word burglar really means is a little bit challenging. The burg in burglar could be related to burg, uh, as in like Pittsburgh or so forth, which means a fortified area. So burglar is someone who breaks into that. Or it can be related to um, words like bourgeoisie and meaning like sub, uh, you know, household. So someone who breaks into a household. And, and there's some thinking back and forth uh, on what that means. And it also might mean something to do with um, uh, in, involved with breaking through defenses and, and so forth. And interestingly, Tolkien was working with Simone de Ardenne on that material in 1932, 33, 34, and The Hobbit's published in 37, and a burglar is at the center of The Hobbit. And I think that's how Tolkien's mind worked a lot. There would be some 
problem in medieval literature, some, some challenge, and sometimes he couldn't solve it with the, ev the evidence just isn't there. So he would make up a story instead. And the story wouldn't be something that he could publish in the Journal of English and Germanic Philology or Medium Avum or something like that, but it ended up in his work. Um, I'll give you another example though. Uh, Tom Shippey, the greatest uh, of all Tolkien scholars, um, recently retired uh, from St. Louis University, but had taught, uh, he had Tolkien's old chair at Leeds um, before that from, you know, and then Tolkien had moved to Oxford, but Shippey, and Shippey worked with, uh, you know, he knew Tolkien, he talked to him, um, points out that we have a text by uh, a guy named Snorri Sturluson, sort of the, the great um, writer of Old Norse, almost everything we know about Old Norse religion and um, culture comes through the works of Snorri. Snorri says that there are dark elves, light elves, and dwarves. And he never really explains what this means. Hundreds of years later, uh, Jacob Grimm, who you know from Grimm's fairy tales, uh, the other, probably the greatest philologist ever and the founder of linguistics and the, the collector of myths and so forth. He says, well, clearly dark elves and dwarves are the same thing. There's no two kinds of elves. And, and that's where it kind of stopped for scholarship and until Tolkien comes along. He's like, you know, Snorri is writing in the 1200s and Jacob Grimm is writing in the 1830s. I really want to go with the guy from the 1200s here. So how do you explain that there's light elves and dark elves and dwarves? And Tolkien comes up with not one, but two stories. So the first story is that there's elves and some of them make this really long journey and they get to the blessed land of Valinor and see the glowing two trees and they call themselves the light elves because they've seen the light. And all the other elves, the wood elves and the elves that hide in caves and streams and so forth, they're the dark elves. And so there's elvish racism in that, like the one set mm -hmm. of the light elves think they're better than the dark elves, and the dark elves resent the light elves and so forth. Then he makes up another story also, though. And he says there's this one particular elf named Aeol who only comes out at night and he wears black armor and he hangs out with dwarves all the time. And so many people think that he's a dwarf, but he was actually a dark elf, you know, the elf in the dark clothing or the elf that, so, so he, Tolkien creates this, this whole backstory, which if it had been real, and remember this is all set in Middle Earth, not in Europe or anything, but if it had been real, would have explained why Snorri says there's dark elves, there's light elves, and there's dwarves and why someone later on, like Grimm, would get confused and say, well, the dark elves and the dwarves must be the same. And, and again, this is, this is sort of how Tolkien's mind works. The light elves, dark elves, and dwarves thing shows up in the, the Silmarillion. So you have Burglar in The Hobbit, you have these different kinds of, um, of dwarves uh, and elves showing up. And these, these questions that we have from uh, Old English and Middle English literature are, are, are shaping Tolkien's mind. Um, let me pause for a second there, first, uh, if there are any questions, and second, because I wanna, I keep using these terms like Old English and Middle English literature and Beowulf, and I should probably just remind everyone um, what we mean by, by those terms and, and where they belong. So if you look at the history of the English language, right, we have been speaking some form of, of English, as, at least as we recognize it, uh, for about 1,500 years. So uh, from around the time of the year 500 or so. Uh, the earliest um, phase of that language from about 500 to 1066, which some of you will remember is the date of the Norman conquest when the, the Normans from France conquered England, though I will point out that they were called Normans because they were Vikings who were living in France. England was never beaten by French people. It was beaten by Vikings who happened to live in France and speak French and you know 
be there for centuries, but still Vikings. Um, but the, up till that time, the language was Old English or Anglo-Saxon. Uh, we use those terms interchangeably. The general rule is if you went to, um, to Cambridge University, you call it Anglo-Saxon because it's part of the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic. And if you go to Oxford University, you call it Old English because it's part of the Department of English. But it's the same language that the, they themselves called, them, called their language Anglo-Saxon. Uh, which comes from the name of two of the three Germanic tribes that migrated to England around the year 500. The Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. But it never gets called Anglo-Saxon Judish. It's always just Anglo-Saxon. Um, in any event, that language is a Germanic language. It is what's called inflected, uh, which means that just like Latin or Greek, you have to learn a lot of endings to put at the uh, ends of words. And it sounds something like this. So this is the opening of the great Anglo-Saxon poem, Beowulf. What? We gardenum in year dagum, feod cuninga, thrym ye frunan, hu tha athlingas, elen fremedan. Off chilled chafing, shiadna triatum, monigum maithum, medosetla off tear, eos oda erlas, sit an erest wer, feasat funden, et as frofre a bird. Wilkes under Wolknum, Werth Mundum Tha, O that him I wilch, Thara um Sitendra over Ron Rada, Huran Shouldan, Gomban Guldan, that was God Kuning. And that's the opening of Beowulf. That's what Anglo Saxon sounds like. Takes about a semester uh, for students to learn it well enough to really translate well. So certainly not as hard as learning a, a, a totally distinct language from modern English, but challenging nonetheless. Uh, it's hard to just pick up a book in Anglo-Saxon and, and read it. You really, I mean, you, you might have heard thought was God kuning, and that means that was a good king. So fairly uh, close to modern English. And in fact, the 1,000 most frequently used, of the 1,000 most frequently used words in modern English, 80% of them are Anglo-Saxon. So your and and is and was and that and this and in and on are all the same. But a lot of other words are, are qualitatively uh, different. Though if you read a lot of Tolkien, you'll recognize them because the people of Rohan speak Anglo-Saxon. When they come up and say, Westu Theoden Hal, that means be you king well. And uh, all the names of the places in Rohan are just a description of the place, but in Anglo-Saxon. So there's a big swamp called Wetwang, which means wet place. And there's a set of prairies called the East Emnet, which is the East Prairies. And uh, there's a, uh, you know, a dark, uh, dark valley, which is Dunharrow and so forth. So like there, it's just, it's all a kind of a nice joke for, uh, Anglo-Saxon is reading it because he just, he just takes the descriptions and turns them into proper nouns um, there. So that's Old English, spoken about 500 to about uh, 1066, though in reality it probably got, in fact one of the things Tolkien discovered was, or explained to better, was that it kept being spoken for about 150 years after the Norman Conquest. But it eventually it mutates into uh, Middle English, and that's one the of the participants was saying here real quick that she remembers trying to read that in class in Ireland and it was so hard. Was Beowulf? Um, yes, it was Beowulf. Yeah, that it, it, is, it is a real challenge. Um, I do it as a two semester course. So the first semester is learning the grammar and learning, uh, translating short poems. And then the spring semester, we just translate all of Beowulf. And it takes the whole semester. It's 3,182 lines. And it was really challenging to do it this year with missing, you know, weeks and doing it remotely. But my students did an incredible job. And yeah. um, at least one of those students is now going to do an honors thesis on Beowulf in the, in the fall. So oh, very cool. That it worked out well. Um, so Anglo-Saxon, and that was really Tolkien's great uh, love. But he also taught Old Norse which isn't directly part of uh, English, except it strongly, strongly influenced uh, the, the change in Old English uh, to the next phase, which is we call Middle English. So in between the old and the modern is the middle, 
this is the language of Chaucer, Gowan and the Green Knight, and that uh, Life and the Passion of St. Juliana, and a quite number of other, <clears throat> other texts. And uh, Middle English uh, sounds much more like Modern English. So this is the opening of Chaucer's uh, The Canterbury Tales. Many of you uh, might know this. I force my students to memorize and recite, uh, and recite it uh, every time I teach it. Uh, so it's, Juan that's April with his surest sorter, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota, and bath at every vine and switch the cour, of which virtue and dendred is the fleur. One zephyrus ache with his sway the brave, in spirit heart and every holt and haith, the tender crop is and the youngest sonne, half in the bram is half coursey rana, and small a fool is mocking melodia that slept in all the nicked with open ear, so pricketh them natura in her courages, far ne long in folk to go on pilgrimages. So you can, you can hear a lot more familiar words in, in Middle English. Um, and it used to be always taught that Middle English was what happened when Old English, a Germanic language, and French, a Romance language, ran into each other. That turns out not to really be true. It's what happened when Old English, a Germanic language, and Old Norse, also a Germanic language, ran into each other and confused the heck out of everything. And then a whole bunch of French vocabulary came in. Because what we've studied and found out, interestingly, is that French vocabulary didn't start to enter English until after England and France split apart again after 1200. Because, and it's the same reason why we're not importing a ton of Spanish words into English or English words into Spanish, because most of the speakers, if they're truly bilingual, just switch. You don't need to bring a French word in, you just switch to French and speak that part. And the same thing with bilingual speakers of English and Spanish. They don't have to take Spanish words and bring them into English, they just switch over, talk some Spanish for that particular point or idea. And then, um, and then switch back. So it's only after the France and England are no longer united that uh, the French vocabulary comes in. But that gives us Middle English. And it has lasting effects to this day in that our words in certain uh, semantic domains or the technical term, and so about certain topics are highly French. All our words, for example, for cooked food are French, Whereas our words for the raw food, for the animal that it comes from, are Anglo-Saxon. So we have, uh, in Anglo-Saxon, we have a coo, which is a cow. But we get to boeuf, beef, which is the French word from there. We have a chicken, good Germanic word, but poultry, uh, poulet, that comes, that's the, the French. We have sheep, but mouton, for the food, for mutton. Um, I think I saw a hand. That'd be me. Yes. Quick question. Um, would that be because most, a lot of the cooks that came, they, the English liked, the rich English liked a lot of French cooks? Um, well, it came about originally because the, uh, what, when the Norman conquest happened, they did not, uh, the Normans did not like commit a genocide against the Anglo-Saxons. They just killed the, the leaders. Okay. And they took their spots. So the, the wealthy and powerful were all speaking French among themselves, and to serve them, you had to use the French word. But the people doing the farming and bringing the animals to market were still Anglo-Saxon. Right. And so everybody sort of learned both, but it became specialized. Got the it. same okay. thing interestingly happens in Old Norse, um, when Old Norse and English mix, in that um, sometimes we get both words rather than one word out competing, but they differentiate. And so my favorite one of these is in Anglo-Saxon, you had a word, shirt, and a shirt meant a tunic. So yeah. like a, all the way, you know, top, but also down to your knees, right? Old Norse had the same word, but in Old Norse, it was pronounced a skirt, but it was the same exact thing. So what happens is the Old Norse form, form becomes the bottom half, and the Anglo-Saxon form becomes the top half. A uh, ship and a skip is the same thing. Yeah. A skip now is like something that you put on a ship to, right. to um, ship it somewhere. 
So that, um, and this is the kind of stuff that Tolkien um, studied even before the Oxford professorship. He was a, um, someone just said like a skipper. Like a skipper. A skipper is, the, is a shipper. It's the guy in charge of the ship. Um, and so many words, like anytime you find a pair that has like, uh, like uh, to, to scream and to shriek. No, there's a couple, there's a couple others that they've, they've uh, come in in those SC and SH pairs. Uh, and, there's, and there's other ones too. And it, it's very strange. Like we have, uh, if you have, if you say an arm and a leg, Mm -hmm. You're using an Anglo-Saxon and an Old Norse word. Uh, ham, uh, uh, ham and eggs. Ham is Anglo-Saxon and eggs are Old Norse. Uh, oh. Heaven and sky. Sky is Old Norse. Um, heaven is Anglo-Saxon. And so there's, uh, and Tolkien studied this in great, in, in great detail, trying to figure out why, uh, why words change, what they used to mean, um, what a really ambiguous word in a text that we don't we'll no longer have the word anymore, what it might mean, um, so to, or, or what the source of it uh, could be. So here's another example. Tolkien, um, some of you might know this riddle, uh, an eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face, uh, said the one eye to the other eye, this eye is like to that eye, but in a high place, not a low place. And Gollum takes a long time to figure that one out, but eventually gets that it's sun on the daisies. And, oh, okay, like a sun looks like an eye. But there's actually a deeper joke in that, in that the word daisy is an Anglo-Saxon joke, almost. It's the day's eye, because the daisy opens up and, you know, it looks like the sun. And so Tolkien's playing on, like, it's the day's eye, it's the sun, and, and they're, the, they're the same and, and so forth. Mm. And, and, you know, and, and I see even before he ended up at Oxford, he was doing this. Uh, Tolkien worked for a couple of years for the Oxford English Dictionary, um, working for uh, Mr. C.T. I have his book here. The Oxford Dictionary of English Etymology, one of my favorite books. Miss, by Mr. Uh, it would look like this is C.T. Onions. But in fact, Mr. Onions pronounced his name Old Ions and told everyone to call him Old Ions because he, like Tolkien, was from Birmingham. But unlike Tolkien, he never lost his Birmingham accent. He would even call things like the sidewalk would be the horse road. And, um, and, and Tolkien, on the other hand, became completely Oxfordized and has the, the plush, plummy accent of uh, Oxford. But onions or on ions uh, mm -hmm. worked for the the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, and when Tolkien worked there, he helped define um, the words in W. They were okay. up to W by then um, in the 1920s. So when you read the definition of the word walrus, or wagon, or wane, or wasp, you are reading something that was at least partially written by J.R.R. Tolkien. And I mean. I still think, obviously, writing The Lord of the Rings is a greater achievement, but I would go happily to my rest if I knew that I'd written the definition for walrus as uh, one of my first jobs. So This sounds like a Jeopardy question, just so you know. <laughs> ah, that could work, yeah. <laughs> Who wrote the definition of walrus for exactly. the Oxford English Dictionary? Exactly. <laughs> and the thing that's weird about that is that, that the words for walrus all mean like something like horse whale. And I have no idea why a walrus would make people think of a horse. It doesn't look like one at all to me, but there must be something, maybe it's how it, a noise it makes or how it tastes when you eat it or something like that. I, I don't know. Or water horse. Yeah. yeah it's the whale horse. Um, and, and this is the kind of work that Tolkien did. So I'll, in that, in that bit of Beowulf that I, that I recited for you in, um, in Old English, he says uh, that the line is uh, over the Hronrade, and that's over, uh, it's always translated as over the whale's road. And this is an example of something that we call a kenning. It's a, it's a small, like kind of like fossilized metaphor that people don't necessarily pull to pieces to think about. You just say like, 
in poetry, in Old Norse poetry, you could just say Wales Road when you need a word for ocean that starts with W, uh, for example, or in this case, it starts with H because it's Hron. But Tolkien um, looked into this more carefully. And in his, uh, his translation of Beowulf and his commentary on it, some of which I, I edited for a while, um, he, he says, well, now a Hron is not a whale because it says a Hron is larger than a seal and smaller than a whale. And so it is not the whale road, it's the porpoise road. But in fact, it's not road either because rod, though it sounds like road, is actually riding, like an area where things would go up and down like people on a horse or so. It's the porpoises riding. It's not like some kind of subterranean railroad. I've been working on the whale road. And, 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 but yet then when he does the translation, he translates it as whale road. So I don't know what to tell you there, uh, except that this is, the way his mind worked, which was what is a, a plausible, reasonable story that explains the, the word or the form or the poetry that you have. And in this case about the whale road, I think his point is why is it said that, that he had to do this not over like the whale's road, but the porpoise's riding, it may even be the point that the king that's being talked about here had sort of local power, right? He controlled areas that he could reach on ships over fairly shallow water, like where the porpoises go, not necessarily the deep water where the big whales are. And, and Tolkien was always trying to understand the, the old texts in that kind of way, uh, trying to get inside the head of the writer and always assuming that the writer knew what he was about and didn't just make, you know, Homer nods, you know, made careless mistakes. Uh, though occasionally Tolkien made uh, careless, or I don't know if they were careless, um, made some uh, mistakes. Uh, there's a, a woman named Rona Bear, and I, I had the great honor of having um, an essay of mine in a collection with one of hers and then meeting her uh, sister, Rona Bear Pestway, like uh, three years ago. But she was a a uh, very frequent correspondent with Tolkien when The Lord of the Rings came out. And she wrote to him and said, you said that elves don't ever have a saddle or bridle, but they always wear ride bareback. But you said that Frodo pulls on the reins of the elf horse and that the bit jangles and everything. And Tolkien wrote back and said, you're right, I'll fix it. And in the later editions of the Lord of the Rings, it doesn't say bridle and bit, it says headstall. So just like a decorative bit. But he forgot to change the part where Frodo uses the reins and the stirrups to stand up to like tell the Black Riders to go back to, to Mordor. Probably because that scene wouldn't work if Frodo just had to like, you know, cling to the back of like a little tiny hobbit on a giant horse. Yeah. And, but that also gives you, I think, a sense of the, um, the kind of attention to detail that uh, that Tolkien used, and that's part of, uh, and that's what that's part of the philological training. And in, 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 when you're you're trained as a philologist, you're looking at things like the spelling and the details of spelling, and trying to pick out patterns. Um, so, in fact, the the research that got Tolkien his Oxford job was not on Old English or, or Beowulf, though he then ended up writing the single most important essay that's ever been written about Beowulf. But before that, the thing that got him the job was working on a text like The Life and the Passion of St. Juliana, which were these texts called the Catherine Group. Um, these were a, a set of texts found from the West Midlands of England um, in the 12, for the, from the 1200s going a little bit later, and um, written for nuns. They were like uh, one called Ankrena Wissa, which is like how to be a good nun and holy uh, maidenhead. So holy virginity and why it's a good thing for nuns to have that. And these texts, they've now, people are now more interested in them because they're interested in like what it must've been like to be a medieval nun. And they're some of the only examples we have of women's writing from the time period. But in Tolkien's time, people were not very interested in these texts. Um, 
it for their content, but Tolkien read them very, very carefully and he noticed one little thing. He noticed that some verbs that in Old English are what are called class two verbs, that means they're spelled I-A-N in the infinitive form, were spelled I-E-N. And most people would be like, oh, look, there's an error. He's like, no, it's not an error. That's consistent. And it's only these kinds. And then his knowledge of linguistics and philology led him to the conclusion that this showed, because it was so consistent, that this showed that Anglo-Saxon had continued to be spoken in the West Midlands for an extra hundred years after the Norman conquest. And not just, you know, peasants, but people who could write were speaking it because the language had time to change even further before it be became Middle English and it changed in its own divergent way. So through these little spelling consistencies and inconsistencies, he recovered a chapter of the lost history of, of England and of the English language and of this community of monks and nuns in you know, the equivalent of the Midwest, uh, you know, out of the way, quiet, just going on with its own life, kind of like his shire uh, would, have, would have been. And, and it's that ability to be an incredibly observant and uh, like effective philologist, right? Someone who notices the patterns and then to have the level of creativity to come up with a story that explains the, the patterns, whether that's just making it up completely or it's, uh, it's piecing it together and, and doing it as, um, as research. And so these, these problems in the texts were, were, I think, what inspired him. I'll, I'll give you another example. In Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which is here, uh, the Poems of the Pearl manuscript, uh, no one can ever decide what this poet's name is. Uh, his, well, his name, he's anonymous, but he wrote Sir Gowan and the Green Knight and he wrote Pearl. And so half the time he's called the Gowan poet and half the time he's called the Pearl poet, but it's the same person. Um, and in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, there's this passage that says like, here's what uh, Gowan did when he rode his horse for a year and a day seeking the Green Chapel. And it says that um, at times he fought bears, at times he fought bulls and boars and worms, dragons from the high fells, and at times he fought wood woeses. Well, nobody knew what the heck a wood was. There's no evidence, though Tolkien thought, and if you know anybody whose um, last name is Woodhouse, uh, that they might originally be wood woes. It probably means woods dweller. But we still don't know what that means and why Gowan is fighting these woods dwellers or, or whatever. And, um, and someone says uh, in, the, in the questions, is it a fae? It, it could be. It probably means like someone who's uh, a fairy related or, or you know, a, a dweller in the woods. But notice what Tolkien did with it. He made up his wood woeses, the wild men of the woods, gone bury gone, in the, the Lord of the Rings um, and has it, and then in the Silmarillion and in, in the Unfinished Tales really more than anything else, comes up with a whole story that these are people descended from the forefathers of humans, but who had nothing, wanted nothing to do with Sauron or the elves either and just wanted to be left alone. Um, in that way, they're kind of like, I don't know, you'd say like the, the, the Native Americans uh, who really weren't implicated you know, in the whole thing of the elves and, and everything else. They just wanted to be left alone, but you know, for that one time, they decided to help the good guys um, in, the, in the book. And again, there's no evidence that this is what a wood woes was. And I actually think that the comment, is it a fae? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's someone like uh, a creature like Jenny Greenteeth or, or you know, Peg Powell or one of these um, woods or water monsters that, that eats and disappears children in um, English folklore. But again, Tolkien made a really interesting, you know, fascinating story uh, out of this one, you know, one little bit. Uh, in, in Beowulf, there's, there's many of those that inspired Tolkien. Um, this is my teaching copy of, uh, of Beowulf that I had. Uh, I found someone finally who would 
helped me print the, the text in really large paper so I had room to annotate the whole thing and also bind it. And then after I'd already bought it and was going to pick it up, I found out that she was a Wheaton grad also. Um, <laughs> You guys are everywhere. We're everywhere. Can't help it. <laughs> but in Beowulf, there's this line um, about the monster Grendel. And it says that Grendel is of the kin of Cain, uh, right? So he's the reason Grendel's evil. He's descended from the first murderer. By the way, the Anglo-Saxons, they did not get the whole Adam and Eve thing. Like they knew the story when they converted to Christianity, but they it didn't seem to really resonate with them. Like, what? You're in trouble for eating an apple? Like, oh, uh, whatever you say. They instead totally understood Cain and Abel. They thought, oh, a brother killed another brother, and that's the source of all evil. You bet. That's how it is. Um, they believed that because Anglo-Saxon England had a um, a system called Weregeld, uh, which means the were means man. So a werewolf is a man wolf. Um, and uh, a where geld is man gold or man price. And it meant that if, if you killed someone, yep. you could settle that killing by paying the man price. Now, this was not like a rich people just kill anybody because the man price went up. Um, if you had more, it went up. Um, and, and yes, there are wood elves in, in Lord of the Rings, um, but they're distinct from the wood woeses. They're, they're the elves that dwell in the, in the woods. Um, and I'll get to them in just a second. So nice, uh, excellent uh, question. So anyway, there was this idea of a man price, right? That um, you could pay, but the one killing you could not fix with a man price was someone in your own family. Because the money would just, it'd be like taking money from your right pocket to your left pocket. You know, the, the, the gold is the property of the whole family. So if you kill a brother, you have to either be executed or go into exile because there's no one who can, you can't pay it back to yourself. And so um, the Anglo-Saxons really thought brother killing was like the absolute worst thing and that it, it, it had this fascination for them. So when the monster in Beowulf, Grendel, is said to be descended from Cain, that makes sense. But then the poet says there's other things that came from Cain also. And he says they are Eotonos and Ulfa and Orkneas, which literally translates as Etons and Elves and Orkneas. Now, Elves? Why are Elves in with the bad guys? And the answer is that the Anglo-Saxons seem to have thought Elves were bad. Right? The Anglo-Saxons were afraid of elves, except that they gave their children names that meant elf. So uh, King Alfred, the Alf in Alfred is elf. And so his name means counseled by elves, elf counsel or elf guidance. And um, a, a very popular woman's name is Alf Gifu, gift of the elves. And so there's a, there's a positive side for, for elves too. Uh, in the, the poem Judith, uh, Judith, the uh, leader of the Bethulians, one of the uh, like heroic women from the Bible, is described as Ida's Alfshiene, an elf shiny maiden. So elf shiny is good in some way, but elves are bad. Elves will, you get elf shot and that's like having a seizure because yep. the elves shot you with something. And um, so there's this, this complicated view of elves. Well, notice what Tolkien does with the wood elves that someone uh, brought up in the, in the comments, that um, the, the wood elves are somewhat hostile to outsiders. And more importantly, the people of Rohan are deathly afraid of them, right? They're always like, oh, you went to the sorceress in the golden wood? And then Gimli's like, yeah, and I'll fight you if you say anything bad about her. You know, she's my girlfriend now. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love Gimli. Um, I love that, that scene um, there where, you know, he's like, so I'll, like, I'll chop your head off, Amor, if you say something bad about Galadriel. Um, but the, uh, the Rohirrim are, they speak Anglo-Saxon, and they're afraid of elves because of how dangerous and powerful the elves are, and because... People have been whispering bad things in their ears. Sauron and so forth has been telling them elves are evil and, and, and so forth. So look at the grouping then. You have Ettons. What are Ettons? Well, Ettons seem to be trolls. Tolkien uses the word in the Etton Moors 
as a place that Aragorn says he's not going to go because there are trolls there. Um, so Ettons and Elves and also Orkneas. And in some unpublished work that I had the good fortune to work with, um, Tolkien translated Orkneas as Barrow White. So you know from Lord of the Rings that Barrow White is some kind of animated corpse. And that's what he originally seems to have thought the orcs were. That's why, by the way, what, uh, the origin of the orcs is one of the biggest arguments in Tolkien studies. Like, where do these orcs come from? In the Silmarillion, uh, it says that the orcs were elves that uh, Morgoth had captured, tormented and mutated into orcs. But then the question is, where do they keep coming from? There can't be that many elves that you can turn into orcs and then they get killed in huge numbers and then there's yet more. Then Tolkien says something, and maybe they're like men that have been changed. Um, but I think his original conception is that they're like zombies, that they are animated corpses. And the reason is that way it would be okay to kill them. Because Tolkien worries about this. Even he gets criticized for it today, like people just slaughtering orcs and, and everything. And, and I don't buy a lot of it because it's, it, I find it actually really offensive to say that, you know, um, Someone says, I always thought they were human. That was what Tolkien thought like later in his life, he decided that maybe they were humans who started worshiping the Dark Lord and then were transformed. Um, Tom, Sh yeah, Elves Gone Bad. Gone bad. Um, yeah. and, and Tom Shippey thinks that it should have been actually that, that what Peter Jackson did with Saruman with the breeding, like the weird breeding them out of mud and membranes and stuff like that would have been another way or that they bred like flies. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons, there was this really creepy thing that like orcs had litters like puppies. And so there'd be like giant mother orcs with like 20 little baby orcs. And uh, that was Dickie also. Um, so, and, and I think the point is, right, that is, as Tolkien said in a letter, in a book that breathes mercy from one end to the other, you shouldn't really complain about no quarter given to orcs. But he did. He like worried about that. And, and it, it's the, the problem was as soon as he made them sentient, as soon as he made them, you know, talk and argue and stuff with each other, they became people. And then it became not, you know, not morally okay to just slaughter them. And so, you know, when he gets criticized for that, I'm like, he, he knew that was an issue, but you'd have pretty lame battles if there were no orcs to, to fight. Um, and, and the whole point is obviously that, uh, like for when Sam sees the the member of the Haradrim who'd been killed, and instead of being like angry or "Yay, we killed him," he thinks, "I wonder why this man was here and how lonely and sad he was far from home, and what lies he must have been told." And and you know, it says it was Sam's first view of the wars of men against men, and he did not like it much. So I mean, I'm going to take the view of the person who'd been in the trenches in World War One uh, about how negative war is. And, uh, but point out again that Tolkien's trying, he's got this ambiguous word in Beowulf, Orkneas. Um, some people think it's a reference to the Roman god Orcus, god of the dead in, in Rome. And so it would be like Orc, dead, um, Neas, like those who, who were dead. Uh, I don't really think Tolkien believed that. He said like in a letter, maybe it could be that. And that's usually his way of saying, actually, you're totally wrong, but I'm too polite to say so. Um, but whatever it was, he was trying to figure out, like, what could these orcs be? Um, the, the, there's, there's many other examples of that. There's a, there's a line in Beowulf where the, the poem says something uh, that just makes no sense. It uses the word grumman, which isn't really a word in Anglo-Saxon, and it gets emended all these different ways by scholars, and Tolkien takes it much further, and he's like, oh, I think that word was grima and that a later scribe didn't recognize what it was because it's such an old fashioned ancient word. And, and that would mean mask. And the reason this is such a brilliant idea is that we know from uh, the Sutton Who treasure, which was uh, dug up in England in 19, in the right before World War II in the, yeah. the late thirties, that, at least some Anglo-Saxon, maybe their dress helmets or whatever, had a, a metal mask as part of the helmet, 
So in fact, if you saw the warriors coming down off a boat and it said the masked ones came rather than the furious ones or something like that, it would make complete sense. And here's Tolkien changing what's in the Beowulf manuscript um, to make it make more sense and coming up uh, essentially with a, with a story uh, about it uh, again. So when the origin of Tolkien's ideas then were the, the languages and the texts and the remains uh, that we have from this medieval period, from around the year 500 to um, 1500 or so, and going back further, uh, when you're when you're going back to um, older material, and how could this be preserved in in a, in a manuscript like this? Well, part of it is probably oral tradition, and part of it we just don't know, but we do know it was preserved. And it was actually Tolkien's son Christopher who identified one of the best pieces of evidence for how long texts like this can preserve information and transmit it. And uh, there's a thing that, uh, a text that Christopher translated called the Saga of King Hydric the Wise. It's in Old Norse. So it was written in Iceland in the 12 through the 1300s. Mm -hmm. But it talks about a battle that happened between the Goths and the Huns in the 300s. So a thousand years before. Now, okay, that could be a famous battle, but here's the thing. It says that battle happened under Harpat. And like Christopher looks at that and realizes that that is the Carpathian Mountains where the actual battle of the Goths and the Huns happened on the plains under the shadow of the Carpathian Mountains. But that word continued to be passed down to the point where the person in Old Norse who's passing it down has no idea what it means. And yet it's still preserved and it's still uh, transmitted that way. And that's, you know, that's the, the joy of this philological work and the fascination. Um, Tolkien himself and working with his son Christopher looked at another name that you may be familiar with, but that maybe tells us a lot about the history of uh, the lost history that he wanted to recreate. And that's the name of Attila. You know him as Attila the Hun. So anyone here who speaks uh, Russian or Polish knows that the word for father in those languages is something like Ata or Atsa, uh, right? And Attila is also the word for father in Gothic, but with a diminutive. So it means little father. Okay, now why does, this, why does this matter? It matters because Attila was, as his name would suggest, a Hun. And he was, his name is in Gothic. And the Goths were the deadly enemies of the Huns. They're the Capulets and the Montagues. They hate each other and they fight all the time. So why is Attila's name in Gothic? And the answer Tolkien came up with is that that name was given to him by Gothic mercenaries who were fighting for him because when Attila would conquer people, he'd give them a choice of, I could kill you or you come fight for me if you're a brave warrior. And so these were the Gothic warriors had come over to his side and given him the name of Attila, little father. In other words, Attila the Hun made his enemies call him daddy and <laughs> And that's why I think there needs to be, there needs to be a musical, like, you know, the, the, the Hamilton equivalent of Attila the Hun, like Big Daddy Hun would, would work yeah. for anyone who wants. I give this idea for free to anyone who can write it. <laughs> um, but the point is that Tolkien and, and his son Christopher were using that and they're using it to figure out things uh, like in a, in a text, uh, an old Norse poem called Atlamal, the Lay of Atli. Um, there's two brothers, Gunnar and Hugni, you recognize them if you know Wagner, who get invited to the court of Attila. They're going to be betrayed there. They know they're going to be betrayed because their sister sends them a secret message by wrapping a wolf's hair around a ring so that they know that this invitation is a trap. And they say it. Well, it's a trap, isn't it? Yeah, it's a trap. 
then there's a pause like we're going right oh yeah absolutely we're going and so it's this is always interpreted as like the bravery of a germanic you know who won't turn down and there's and there's something really to that but it's also the fact that they knew that a bunch of goths were serving with attila so another plausible thing is they thought they could get all those goths to switch sides and defeat him and they almost do they come very close uh, to uh, defeating, to defeating him uh, there, and then it's, uh, he's he's killed by his uh, by his wife, uh, one of his wives, uh, after a feast. Now, supposedly he just drank so much that he had a, a nosebleed and drowned. But his wife's name was Ildiko, which is probably a non-Germanic person trying to do the Germanic name Hild, which means battle or warrior maiden. And I'm pretty sure that at least some of the, the people who are writing about this are like, oh, she was a German name killed. She killed him. They made up the bloody nose thing. She stabbed him. She didn't want to be his wife. Um, and, and Tolkien kind of talks about, about that in his, in his scholarly work too. But you can see it. Uh, you can see all this material fed through the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, the Silmarillion, whether it's names or dramatic actions or explanations of why there's a broken sword that's so important, or even finally, where the ring may come from. And this is what I'll kind of wrap up the talking, the, you know, the, the non-question part with. Um, this is a theory that's in part mine and part comes from a really great Israeli scholar of Tolkien named um, Simon Cook. And it's that we know there was something um, in Old Norse mythology called the Peace of Frothi. Now Frothi, if you took that name from Old Norse and translated it into Anglo-Saxon, would be Frodo. And it means wise one. And it is said that during the time of the Peace of Frodo, a man could find a gold ring, could leave a gold ring lying by the side of the road and come back and find it in the same spot a year later. Now, why do I think that that's part of Tolkien? Because Faramir, remember Boromir's brother who they, they meet, says at one point to Frodo, not if I found the ring on the side of the road, would I pick it up? And that's gotta be a reference to the piece of Frodo and I think what Tolkien's doing there, especially when you read some stuff at the end of the Silmarillion of, of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, is that he's imagining what the world would remember of the events of the Lord of the Rings if they'd really happened. And that would be that there was this great peace and prosperity after the fall of Sauron, and that it was due to someone named Frodo. But of course, in our world, we wouldn't think it was a humble hobbit who carried and destroyed a ring. We would just know that it had something to do with a ring, something to do with a ring lying on the side of the road, and probably the king's name must have been Frodo. And so there, Tolkien creates a plausible story about why there would have been this imagined idea of the peace of Frodo, and how, in fact, the story could have, been, could have really happened there. And if you read the end of, of the Rings of Power in the Third Age at the end of the Silmarillion, it tells the story of what Frodo did, except it leaves out the whole Gollum thing. It basically says Frodo walked to Mordor and threw the ring in the volcano and it was great. Of course, we know that's not what happened uh, when we know the real story as uh, Tolkien told it. And I, I think that that is what, what he got, where he got his ideas of what he got from his day job was a deep understanding of how stories are made and how they evolve, how information is lost and how we have to fit it back together and, and how a mythology gets created and fits into the minds of, of its, its hearers and readers. It's the mythology that we want. And, and in that sense, then, if you look at what he's doing with the Lord of the Rings, he was creating a mythology of what he believed and and he wanted which was a mythology that said that throwing away power over other people was the moral thing to do not gaining more power uh, over them and and 
it's for those and many other reasons that I just admire him him so much to be to be in an age and in a time period, the 20th century and maybe now the 21st, where all we seem to care about is getting power over the others. And yet its most popular and beloved mythology is a story about how the only moral thing to do is not dominate anyone else. And, um, and, I, and I think that this, this deep knowledge of literature and language is what led Tolkien to understanding how to create such a thing. Thank you. That thought. was amazing. Thank you very much. Is there anyone have questions? Please ask your questions. I, um, I, the one of the, I had two questions. Um, the one is, do you think maybe some of the stories that he created with these words was a way for him to remember? And then the second question I have is, uh, are you excited about the similarian coming out? Um, well, we don't know what's coming on with the, uh, the Amazon series. I'll take the second okay. question first. Uh, we really don't know what's going on with that. Um, I, I missed my chance maybe to find out. And, and I mean, nobody knows, right? Um, I consult for Turbine, or now they're Standing Stone Games, um, that do Lord of the Rings Online. And when the announcement of the Amazon series came out, their lead designer called me and said, okay. Mike, what do you know about this? And I'm like, Chris, I was about to call you. What do yeah. you know about this? And okay. nobody, nope, they have kept it a dead, dead secret um, about what they're doing. The only thing we can figure out is that the maps they've released have Numenor on them. Okay. And since Numenor sinks at the end of the Second Age, it has to be before that. Okay. If Numenor's on the map. Um, so, but we, it, I mean, Christopher Tolkien apparently, or, or the Tolkien estate said it's not the Silmarillion. Uh, so it might be unfinished tales material. Uh, it's, it's more likely to be stuff from the appendices of the Lord of the Rings that they've just decided to build out, um, in some way, but nobody, nobody really knows though. I've heard more rumors now that there's more Silmarillion, like it could go back, you know, further, um, and uh, I, I don't, I, I don't think that anything's really leaked, uh, okay. as far as I know. Um, and, and the first question is, did he did he work these things to to help him um, remember them? Probably. I mean, he he had he memorized enormous chunks of of poetry. When sure. I, I recited the first eleven lines of Beowulf, he would recite the first fifty yeah. to start out his his lectures on Beowulf. And I used to think that this was his way of scaring students out of the class so that he didn't have a lot of papers to grade. But then I learned that Oxford doesn't work that way. And it, yeah. he would have had the same number of papers to grade no matter what. So that, that theory went. Okay. Um, and, and I don't use it to scare my students out. I try to get them to come in instead. Because there's a lot of theatrics to the, because it seems like, because it was such a vocal uh, language and presenta presentation, excuse me, of the story. But I was just curious. Um, one of the questions here is, do you think the elves' power came from D&D? &D? Um, so the D&D &D was uh, created more of uh, in a, in a um, response uh, or inspira inspired by Tolkien. Um, Gary Gygax really created the first D&D uh, &D stuff in the late 60s, early 70s. So Tolkien had been there, there first, um, and Gygax was much, you know, was really good as a systematizer, as coming up with, um, you know, rules that made having a role-playing game possible uh, in a way that, like, the, the way Tolkien does things is the elves power sort of like whatever he needs it to be, like, oh, we can read moon letters, and oh, yeah, healing, we need some healing. And, I mean, I'm not making fun of it, it's just like that, you know, the story doesn't reveal all of their um, powers. But I would say, and, and there's an interesting tidbit on this, in that uh, after Gary Gygax really got Dungeons and Dragons going, the, they were threatened, TSR, I think it was, uh, was threatened with a big lawsuit by the Tolkien estate. And so Gygax had to go back and take out all the specifically Tolkien stuff. And I think this really irritated him because he, everything that he possibly could leave, he did. And not only that, he made like only the most minor changes. So they told him he had to take out a Balrog because Balrog was, um, you know, Tolkien's in invention. So he put in a Balror 
you know, change one letter, <laughs> a bowel yeah. or a demon. And, um, you know, hobbits became halflings uh, because he found that in some other, you know, text, someone had said halfling and rangers were still there because the Texas rangers were, were allowed and, and so forth. So um, it's, Tolkien got a lot of his elf lore from uh, a text called Sir Orfeo, which is a, a weird, weird text. It's the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice, but moved to medieval um, Europe. And so like, the, and, and the king of the elves is the one who grabs Eurydice and drags her down to not Hades, but to elf land. Um, and Tolkien got a lot of his images and ideas of elves from, from that text, which he translated for uh, World War II cadets who were taking a language course at Oxford before being shipped off to fight. And he translated that for them so they could um, read it. And so that was in his mind around that time period. Thank you. Any other questions before we sign off? What was that title one more time? We, oh, Sir um, Orpheo. Whoa. Oh, wait. Chris. Neil Stevenson mentioned the elves in um, the, crypt the, of one in, in the, the Stevenson's book from last summer. I read it, um, Fall uh, or Dodge in, in Hell. Um, I mean, Stevenson, I guess Stevenson's like first and, and never published novel was a big Tolkienian thing. And so he then, he says that every writer who's a Tristan fantasy either tries to like, tries to murder Tolkien by being totally different or tries to imitate him. And then you finally get that out of your system. And I think he, Stevenson tried to do that in um, fall. And it's, I mean, it's a good epic quest story that's not too blatantly, um, told, uh, you know, too blatantly a ripoff, like something like, I actually really like the book, The Sword of Shannara. I know I'll be struck down now by, <laughs> um, I enjoyed it. I read it when I was, you know, nine years old and it was finally something that was Tolkien-like. Um, but uh, it's a complete ripoff of The Lord of the Rings, even down to like the, the individual plot points and so forth. And that happens a lot with the first fantasy novel that people write, and then they get it out of their system. And then you eventually get someone like, uh, if you want a, a great fantasy book or series that's nothing like Tolkien, that it's really finally its own thing, Lainey Taylor, Daughter of Smoke and Bone, I think the best fantasy in the, the past, you know, 15 years. And it's, it's out of Tolkien's shadow, finally, for something fantasy. Um, one more time, Daughter of Smoke and Bone. And Bone, Smoke and Bone. Um, Lainey Taylor, L-A-I-N-I, T-A-Y-L-O-R. She's really a tremendously good writer. And it's, it's, a, it's fantasy that inner, fantasy and romance, and it works rather than being sappy. Yeah, see, uh, someone said Dresden Files, cough. <laughs> yeah, Dresden Files. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're living through, I think, I mean, we'll see, but there, it, there's, there's a lot of potential for good, you know, new fantasy to be, be coming along now. Urban fantasy yeah. um, and people like uh, China Miavi and, and uh, Neil Gaiman have shaken things up enough that I think that there's going to be a, a new, you know, burst of originality. Because one of the things that happens is Tolkien has a huge shadow. And it's hard to write, you know, in terms of people in the, in the first decades afterwards, I put like only Ursula Le Guin as, I was just, you know, as reaching, it being his equal. In, with her world building, absolutely. And, and, her, and her writing style, yep. which is very different than Tolkien's, but is, is also just very pure and nothing, nothing fake or artificial or awkward of, about it. The, and, and I'm someone who in 1991 wrote the most vicious review of her Tehanu book of anything I've ever written. I published a terrible wow. review of how much I hated it. And then she, she came out with um, The Other Wind, which completely redeemed all of it and made me look like an idiot. So um, see, don't write obnoxious reviews when you're in grad school. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Well, um, the Gorgon Heist trilogy, Gorman Heist. Yeah, Gorgon those, Heist, excuse um, me. 
those are um, those are some of the rare fantasy that's uh, that's a source or some kind of an influence potentially on Tolkien. Um, so Lord Dunsany and, and a number of others are usually looked at as like, this was in the air right when Tolkien started um, writing. Um, and they, they're very good. They're there if you like the, the style. Mervyn Peake, thank you. That's the name I was not pulling up there. Lord Dunsany and Mervyn Peake are both um, considered like the closest immediate precursors to uh, Tolkien by people who know um, the, the fantasy canon really, really well. Uh, one more question I have for you personally is why do you think Tolkien caught the generation of the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, so such on fire? What was it do you think about that generation's thoughts that uh, caught their imagination or really spoke to them? This is a really hard question because when you when you talk to and my dad was one of those um people and when you talk to them about it they all have radically different answers so it's it's hard to know, you know so it was just right at the right time but it's but it's so different for different people like some right. people it was anti-war because of of vietnam and and um and it was uh justice and freedom because of civil rights and other people it was um, environmental and other people it was racism that um, was another one right yeah. and and uh, but on the other hand I know a ton of people who are like well it's it's because it's a deeply deeply Christian um, right. book and therefore it wasn't like attacking my faith and my beliefs like so many other books were and and I, I don't know if I, I think in part it filled a vacuum because so much mainstream literature had followed that kind of the Bloomsbury and Virginia Woolf view that literature was not about mythology. It was not about like big questions of good and evil and, and how should we be in the world, but it was much more about like observations of people's conscious, you know, the great modernist project of let's observe sure. people's consciousnesses and, and the, you know, keep things very small and, and interactive. And this left this huge vacuum for myths and uh, I mean myths and fairy tales are the way we talk about things we're not allowed to talk about that's mm -hmm. Jack Leipzig's theory about fairy tales right it's like you can't go around saying that step parents are far more likely to abuse their children than biological parents because there will be people in your audience who are good step parents who've never done any harm so instead you tell the story of Cinderella and you work through all those kind of um, complications. Um, and that's one of the things Tolkien, I mean, Tom Shippey said it, like that there's this whole group of really beloved writers, Tolkien, uh, Golding, who wrote Lord of the Flies, Ursula Le Guin, Kurt Vonnegut, um, T.H. White with The Once and Future King, that they were not like literary darlings, right? They were writing in genres, fantasy, science fiction, but they were talking about the fundamental problem of the 20th century, which was basically looking around after World War II and going, what the hell is wrong with people? How could we do this? You know, I, I mean, I think it's, um, Golding said, if anyone could get through that war and not think that men produce evil like bees produce honey, he was not right in the head. And mainstream literature wasn't helping us engage with, with, with that. Now you could argue that having a dark lord that fills all the evil roles, you know, is is somehow cheating, but it was getting at something that that people felt deeply, and felt like they needed to have a way to think about it, and literature gives us a way to think about those those things. So I think that in that, given everything that was happening in the country, and especially among young people who had the fear of Vietnam and the fear of being, you know, of avoiding it and then, and then that being wrong and, and all the injustice that was so, you know, had been made so visible. The Lord of the Rings, it's an escape from in some things, but it's also a deep, deep engagement with what it, I mean, and it's, and it's, it, it does provide an answer. Its answer is it's wrong to force people to do things, even when those are the right things. 
You know, right. it's, it's still wrong. You can't force Frodo to throw the ring right. in. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I just want to plug the fact that we have Dr. Barr from UMass Amherst doing a talk on July 29th at 6.30. Uh, she's going to be doing a talk on the dark side of fairy tales. Oh, this is perfect then. So just a perfect segue into something that if you found him starting to talk about Cinderella interesting, you might also find this topic also interesting, which you can sign up on our South Hadley website. So thank you so much for coming. It was so fascinating. I loved listening to you talk about this and um, hope to see you in the future, even if it's That's at Wheaton. Yeah. When we can go in person too, but thanks everyone very much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank awesome. you very much. Have a good one. Night.